Welcome. You're listening to Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin, the only podcast for women providing a physician's point of view on everything relating to women's health, sexual medicine, and cosmetic gynecology. Get ready to discover the latest and hottest topics in women's health and how they relate to you. Hey everyone, this is Dr. David Goslin, and today we're going to do another podcast on women's health and beyond. And today we have a slightly different shift than traditional women's health. I'm really a happy and honored to have Dr. Sarah Shivitz on with us today because she's known in Los Angeles and has founded the Couples Learn Institute. Is that what it's called, the Institute? or Just it's Couples, just couples Learn. Learn. Maybe we should though. I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very academic. Yeah. <laughs> and and she's she's been de- she's been really working with relationships, both figuring out what makes healthy relationships. And I want her to talk today and inform us and educate us a little bit on the signs of a healthy relationship, what are the do's and don'ts, and really also maybe Sarah, you'll have the opportunity to tell us a little bit about what we can do in today's society with isolation and how it's affecting all of us on so many different levels within relationships and outside relationships. So on that note, welcome Dr. Shevitz to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. So I always love to get to know my, my guest a little bit. So I'd love to hear about you and your formative years and, and how did you get to become a therapist? And we all, we're all ears. Okay. Um, so I've been, how long have I been practicing? I've been licensed since 2014, practicing since about 2008 in grad school and all of that. Um, and what got me into psychology in, I know this in retrospect after having done my own personal growth work, but I think growing up in a home with a lot of conflict and dysfunction, really, I was super attracted to the fact when I learned in in classes like you could change that and just learning about oh you you don't have to be in unhealthy dynamics you there's ways to fix that there's ways to recognize it and change it that was really attractive to me um and I say I learned that in retrospect just because I just thought it was interesting in college and then moving on to grad school but as I started doing more of my own personal growth work I realized why it was interesting to me yeah for sure yeah But I founded Couples Learn uh, in 2014 and we're an online therapy practice. So all of our um, sessions are done online through video chat and it's myself and a few other therapists on the team. And we focus solely on the area of love and relationships and uh, childhood wounding that's impacting your relationship. So first of all, I have to commend you because I think that's very progressive that you only have online video chat uh, therapy sessions because during this pandemic, when I was doing telehealth at home, I woke up and said, why haven't I, have I not been doing this? It saves, it saves your clients tons of time sitting in traffic, especially in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And it would make going to therapy so much more enjoyable, I think for me. Right. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. And I think a lot of what you do, certainly, and many MDs do, you have to be physically present for a lot of it, not all of it. Um, but for a psychologist, it's, it's talking. You can, do yeah. this. you can do this over video. There's no reason you need to take hours off of work to drive in traffic and find parking and all that to, just to go to therapy. That's like such a huge barrier to entry to even doing it. Yeah, it makes total sense. So where did you grow up in your younger years? I grew up outside of Chicago, the northern suburbs. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So you're probably very disappointed in our pizza out here. You, we actually have some good Chicago style pizza out here. We do. You have we to, do. after the show, you'll have to give me some pain. I <laughs> actually, during the pandemic, I had some flown in from Chicago. You did? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I love it. That's how yeah. bored I was. Um, I'm so. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I do miss, there's one place in particular that I've never had pizza like that, even Chicago. It's just a different, it's not even Chicago style. It's like its own thing. Yeah, its own little animal. Yeah. So, Sarah, tell us a little bit about the reason of your focus on relationship and love and how'd you get into that aspect of therapy? 
So what I've realized, especially as I get more and more training in the area of attachment and childhood wounding and trauma is that it impacts every facet of our life and how we were loved as children and what kind of attachments we develop to our caregivers. It impacts how you show up in your romantic relationships, how you show up as a parent, how you show up as an employee or an employer. Um, friends, siblings, like all those relationships are influenced by your formative childhood relationships. And it's, it's just really powerful to be able to address that with people and see the ripple effect in all areas of their life, particularly in their romantic relationships, because that's where it shows up the most, probably that and parenting um, are the two most triggering experiences a human can go through. <laughs> No, I, I totally positively agree. Positively and negatively. Yeah. I think it's the only times when you're in, rela in true relationships and as a parent where you don't, you're, you're sort of naked. Yeah. And, and, and you don't have, because when you're at work and you're a professional and you, you, you can have all these different layers sort of protecting your internal psyche, but not as a parent and not when you're in a relationship. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about, so, you know, Los Angeles, in my opinion, is one of the hardest cities to date in. Mm. Um, I've always had this theory when I was younger and single that it's like, there's, it's, it's like LA is like a candy store <laughs> and you walk in and there's so many options to choose from that you can't pick a single one mm -hmm. or you're constantly making the wrong decision because the grass is always greener on the other side. And I think, learning from, from therapists like yourself, Sarah, you know, what are the red flags we should be careful with? I'm gonna let you take off on this one. Okay. But I, I can't wait to hear about it. Okay. So I feel like there's differences in dating red flags and relationship red flags also. So let's start with the dating probably since you brought that up. Um, I think an important, some important questions to ask in your dates with people, and this doesn't necessarily have to be first date, but it can be, is what their past relationships are like and just listening to how they talk about their past experiences. Because a lot of times you'll run into people who have done zero work on themselves, have no insight into how they've contributed to the problems in their past relationships. And they're just very victim-y about the story. Like, oh, well, this she was crazy. All the girls I've dated are crazy or all the guys I've dated are complete jerks. And and they just have this story about I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Huge red flag. I mean, I've been a victim of that. Yeah. Well, and so that, I think that is really prevalent in LA particularly because you've got a lot of people pursuing big dreams, big goals. It takes a pretty like significant ego strength to want to, to think you could make it in the industry, first of all, in the entertainment industry. And secondly, to like really go after it. So you're, you are kind of, I think, finding a higher level of people, higher percentage of people in LA probably that maybe are a little more on the narcissistic side, not like per diagnosable narcissists, but just, you know, a little bit more focused on their needs than others. Sure. And with that comes, often comes little insight into their, how their behavior impacts others. So I think that's a big red flag to look for. Another big red flag in dating is somebody who moves really fast. If they are wanting to be exclusive really fast, wanting to get married, you know, talking about marriage and kids, right? Like not, it's different to talk about, I have a goal of being married and having kids versus I want to do this with you and we've known each other for like two months. They're projecting, they don't even know who you are yet. They are projecting who they think they know and what they think their goals and dreams are onto you. They're not seeing you for who you really are. And they're just kind of trying to check a box almost like wife, check, kids, check, husband, no, totally. check. Um, so yeah, anyone trying to move things along really quickly or stating big, big feelings really quickly. I just don't think they're stopping to, to really see you for you. They're kind of just living in a fantasy and that so, bubble pops. So do you have a little recommendation or pearl on how long should you wait before getting into that? How, I mean, let's say you see the person once a week versus almost an everyday daily thing. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But what, what if you were friends before? Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's still, it's not bad if somebody's saying, hey, I really like you. Like, I really could see us having a future together. That's realistic. That's nice to hear. But if it's, that's different than really pushing to move it along. Like, we've been on three dates and I think we should be exclusive now. Or I think um, three months in, you should just move in. You know, your lease is about to be up. Why don't you just move in? You know, those are, those are, even if you've known each other for years, it feels a bit premature to me because you don't know each other in the context of a romantic relationship all that well yet. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. So I think um, all their exes are crazy. Oh, another thing is their friendships. Pay attention to that. Are they, do they have close friends? Um, do they have a lot of friendships that have dissolved or ended badly or family relationships that have dissolved and ended badly? And how do they talk about that? You know, do they talk about it in a way that's like, yeah, I realized I, my family was toxic and I needed to set boundaries and this is the work I did. That's different. That's, it sounds like somebody who's really got some insight versus, oh yeah, I just cut them off. I can't take it anymore. And not a lot of insight about how they might've contributed or the work that they've done to get to that decision. So talking about friends, you know, a lot of us may have just a few close, close friends, Mm -hmm. But on the same level, we may have a lot of periphery, superficial friends that we like to go out with or play tennis with or whatever. Mm -hmm. So so when you say pay special attention to their friends, are you talking about their best friends? Yeah. Do they have best friends, right? Some people are kind of loners and they haven't been able to maintain relationships with people long term their friends come and go, they're very surfacey relationships and they're cut off very easily, either by the, the other person or the person you're dating. So just paying attention to patterns like that. But yeah, it's not like you have to have 15 best friends that you've known since you were five years old. But if there's a pattern of not maintaining long-term friendships or relationships of you know, a few years or more, um, that's usually a bit of a red flag to pay attention to. It's not grounds for ending a relationship, but if all these compound, it's important to pay attention if a few or more are present, like keep your eyes open. Yeah. 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 Now, let me ask you, you know, based, everybody has different personality traits. Some people are more outgoing than others. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm more introverted and I like to hold very few friends in company, but good friends, should I be dating somebody along with those same qualities? Is that, or, or do opposites really do attract? Um, it could go either way. Introverts and extroverts can get along just fine, but they just have to accept each other for who they are and not hope that they're going to change each other. So, so that's that, a big key. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a big key. If you're going into a relationship and dating their potential, who you think they're going to be in two to five years when you've done your whole fixer upper project. (laughs) Women, we are guilty of this constantly. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. This is not a great plan. Not a great plan. Now, if they're talking about their own goals and where they want to be, and they seem like they have a good plan and they're motivated and you're, that's attractive for you. Fine. But if it's something that you're foreseeing, oh, I can change this, I can change that, and they have not talked about wanting to change anything, that's not a, not a healthy way to start a relationship. So do you have, um, I almost hate to say, like a set of questionnaires that you give your <laughs> clients and say, look, you don't have to do this on the first or second date, by, but you know, I strongly encourage you the first couple of months, I want you to hit all of these points and make sure you've talked about them so it's crystal clear, because... A lot of times we get into these deep, quick relationships and then you realize, wow, maybe my parents were right. Culturally, we're not the same. And, and, mm. and there's so much friction there because of that. So yeah. how do you advise? I mean, I think it's important now, you know, it's such a, we come from such different parts of the world in Los Angeles. And so a lot of times culturally, we're very different. Religious, religion wise, we're very different. Yeah. Um, and so I know, for a lot of people, that's fine when you're single. When the family starts, 
it, it can cause some issues. You're, you're exactly right. It does seem like it will be no big deal until you start having kids and then there's an argument about are we raising them Christian or Jewish or whatever the, you know, I, culturally I want to make sure that we're having this ritual every week and going to church or going to synagogue. So yeah, that does come up and I think it's important to talk about absolutely even in the dating stages of how important is your religious identity to you what are your values and this is important to have done the work yourself to even understand what your values are um what do you foresee in the future do you want kids it's crazy to me how many people don't have these conversations right off the bat why would you bother getting into a relationship with somebody if they're 100% sure they don't want kids and you're 100% sure you do. Because I think a lot of people really believe they can change the other person. Right. Yeah. And you're setting yourself up for heartbreak most of the time. Now, from a, just curious, mm -hmm. from a physical standpoint, do you, I mean, you know, sometimes you move a little too fast, sometimes a little too slow. Is there usually a rule, of, a rule of thumb that you give or recommend for couples or not really? Not really. I think everybody has their own boundaries with that. And it's what's important to me is, are you respecting your own boundaries of what feels comfortable for you? Or are you going into people pleasing mode and moving faster than is comfortable for you or holding out, even though you really want to do something because you feel like that's what a good person does you know, so really just, again, knowing your own values, knowing your own boundaries and understanding what do I want? And that's in general, a really important thing that I see women in particular um, sometimes doing is they get so caught up in, does he like me? Or does this person who I'm dating like me? It's not always a he, of course, um, that they don't stop to think, do I like this person? Is this, do I want to move forward with this person? So it's really important to just stay in a place of assessment and not make a decision based on, well, they checked this box, this box, this box, same religion, both want kids, good family, done. <laughs> you know, When there's all these intangibles that you might be missing because they check the kind of major life boxes that you need. Yeah, I mean, look, I think you're right. When you're single and young, it's easy sometimes to sort of brush aside some of these big issues because you're having fun, you're going out clubbing, it's exciting, it's new, and you're busy with your career at the same time. Um, what about meeting family members and siblings? How important is that? And how much emphasis should we put on, hey, do we, do we like and enjoy being with that other person's family? Right. I think that probably depends on how much time you anticipate spending with that family. So if they're all the way across the country or in another country for that matter, it might not be such a big deal. Um, but if they live around the corner and are a, a very integral part of your partner's life, yeah, you probably want to make sure you can handle them. And that, I think that's another thing people do overlook and realize, Oh my gosh, when, I mean, I've had friends for sure say this to me, like I didn't realize how much I was marrying their family when I married them. <laughs> oh, for sure. And that whole hypo hypothesis of family living in another country for some reason always gets you and they move to wherever you're at. Yeah, that's true. Or they come visit for months on end. <laughs> right, or they get stuck here during a pandemic. <laughs> okay, yeah, that could happen. No, sure. it, it didn't happen to me. But, um, so let me ask you another question. So. Because I know our time is limited and we can spend hours on this. <laughs> so the dating process has gone well. You've asked the right questions. This person seems to be like a really good lifetime partner. Mm -hmm. And you've decided, hey, you know what? Let's, we're going to go ahead and tie the knot and make this happen. And next thing you know, one, two, three kids down the road. And now your relationship's really changed because you're busy at work and you're busy at home. And how do you recommend couples still continue to grow with each other and still enjoy each other's presence more than just, you know, are the kids all right? Is the homework done? Did the kitchen get cleaned? Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's for dinner? 
but really like continue to explore each other and maintain that romantic spirit. Yeah. This is a really important thing to focus on, especially as you have kids and all the things you mentioned of life getting busy. Um, Doctors John and Julie Gottman are kind of the leaders in the field of research when it comes to what makes relationships work and what causes them to fail. And through their research, they found maintaining a strong friendship is linked to maintaining long-term romance. And so ways to establish that and maintain that friendship are having unique, different types of conversations. The Gottmans actually created an app called Gottman Card Decks, which is a free app that gives you open-ended questions to just, you know, ask about each other's hopes and dreams. Like, what do you, what do you want to accomplish this year? Or um, what do you think in our five-year plan looks like? What are you excited about in your life right now? It's so easy for us to just talk about the facts of life versus the more exciting kind of who are you? Who are you becoming? Because we change over time. And what the Gottmans found through their research is we put, we kind of put our partner on autopilot in our brains. So we stop paying attention to them. We stop really listening to what they're saying and asking questions and being curious because we just assume we know already. Kind of like when you're driving a car, when you first learn to drive, you pay attention to every little thing. Put my left blinker on. Okay, turn, you know, 10 and two hands. Like you're really paying attention. And then you get used to it and you stop paying attention. And you'll drive 30 miles and be like, whoa, I'm here. How did that even happen? <laughs> you, just, you weren't even paying attention. That's a great analogy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we do that to our partners. And all of a sudden you might wake up and go, whoa, how did we get here? We haven't had sex in a year. We don't even talk about anything other than the kids. Like that, what happened? Yeah. You know, listen, I think it's something that we all have to work on and it's something that's on everybody's mind all the time. I see it in sexual medicine a lot. Mm -hmm. People come in and they'll say, Dr. G, look, I have no libido. Um, I don't seem to be able to climax anymore. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's true. Physiologically, there's changes as we age and our hormones change and our tissue integrity changes. But at the end of the day, having an orgasm is so multifactorial and I explained that I can put you on testosterone and I can do a PRP shot into your clitoral gland and G spot. But the truth is you really have to want to be with that person intimately for you to achieve that. And, and it's something you're right. And I think we all autopilot way too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for women in particular, there's so much um, emotional, linking and sex and yes and orgasm and the the model of sexuality that we talk about in our in our sex therapy in our practice is the dual model where there's breaks and there's accelerators and a lot of men have responsive sex drive where they see or see something that turns them on or think of something that turns them on and they are immediately responsive they're ready whereas um actually sorry that's the spontaneous sex drive but women have a responsive sex drive so there's a lot of like warm up that needs to happen and not every woman is like this and not every man is like that but um on a whole that is what research shows is that there's you need to remove the breaks so the stress of what are the kids going to eat for lunch tomorrow and i have to do dishes and i have to finish that brief i was working on for work and you know all the things in life you got to remove all that stuff somehow And then also start getting in the mood with your accelerators. So maybe that's your partner lighting candles or drawing you a bath or giving you a massage to continue reducing the stress, getting rid of the breaks. And then maybe you'll feel sexual. Like it's a whole process that can feel overwhelming for some. It's like, it's not even worth it. I don't even want to go through all that. So Sarah, let me ask you. If you're a couple and you have a few kids, do you recommend, I mean, I think it's a good idea, but I always feel like every couple should be in some sort of therapy at some point in their relationship because it's nice to have somebody, for example, like you directing the conversations because we all know when things get a little sour, they can sour pretty fast if you don't have an interpreter Mm -hmm. sometimes. (laughs) Um, But anyways, and then in today's situation where we live, with isolation and we have kids at home, Zooming classes, 
And, you know, I know my wife who works from home traditionally, she is having a much harder time because she can't get done what she normally gets done. And so she's having to deal not only with kids at home trying to do schoolwork and her not being a teacher, but all of a sudden now she's dealing with the situation where she feels a void because she's not satisfying her own needs. And I'm working nonstop, so I feel like I've failed her in many ways because I can't be there. And we've tried doing the half days here and there for me, but it gets really hard as a physician for me to do that because my, my days are never the same. Um, so any recommendations for relationships and keeping people on track and minimizing anxiety and levels of stress and maybe giving people their own time and a little personal time, what do you say? Yeah. Um, meaning specifically now during the pandemic or just yes. in general? Well, well, we'll do it the pandemic for now. Yeah. I mean, I think everything you just described is so spot on about the challenges we're facing. And um, the United Nations just did a study. I actually have these quotes handy, so I want to look it up real quick. But the United Nations did a study on how COVID is impacting women versus men. Um, and, you know, women in many households do the lion's share of housework. And while men do contribute, the study found women spend three times as many hours in unpaid care and domestic work compared to men. And that um, the average, where's this other one? Well, anyway, I can't find it right now and it probably take too long, but um, oh, women spend an average of 4.1 hours a day on that unpaid work, whereas men spend 1.7 hours a day. Well, that unpaid work just got increased a ton because now it includes homeschooling and you may have been able to hire, have a nanny or have a cleaning service. And if you're not able, you know, maybe you're at increased risk for contracting COVID or you're just not comfortable having people come into your home anymore, all of your support is gone. And so the lion's share of that is in many households falling on women and they're overwhelmed beyond belief. Like they already were overwhelmed and now it's just at a whole nother level. So I think it delegating whatever you can with whatever comfort level you have while still maintaining health, you know, your own health, it may be a little scary to bring in a cleaning service, but maybe you can leave the house while they're there or some, some sort of compromise where you're not taking it all on and you're not risking your health if that's a concern for you. Um, same, like maybe you can bring in a tutor that can help with the kids homeschooling or a family member that's retired, you know, maybe you have grandparents around who can stay with you for a while. And I don't, I mean, it's hard because there's the COVID concern there, but not limiting yourself and getting creative about how you can delegate and how you can ask for help. I'd say that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is creating boundaries as much as you can around your physical space for certain periods of time where the kids or the rest of the family know mom is taking a bath for the next hour. Unless you have cut off a finger, you do not knock on this door, you know? And well, even then you go talk to dad. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, unfortunately, most dads, including myself, would see that and be like, oh my God, Jody. Yeah, go tell mom. <laughs> um, I mean, look, I think, you know, I've never been good at, well, I wouldn't say good, but I've never been a strong at-home supporter in the sense that I'm messy and I don't, you know, I will say during this pandemic, especially when we were closed and working and I was working from home, I mean, I took over kitchen duty. That was my thing. And I actually enjoyed it, to be honest. I would put on my earphones and listen to music and that kitchen was spotless. Nice. <laughs> and I'm, now I'm back at work. You know, I, I feel bad because I'm not doing it as much or as, as, as frequently. And I can definitely see my wife gets a little frustrated. But I have been cooking dinners more often. Yeah. So even though I all come home from work, I know she's exhausted. She's headed up to here with the kids. 
and I'll just take over dinner. Yep. And, and, and that seems to help a little bit. Yeah. And maybe even though it's um, financially a little bit more expensive, maybe you start ordering a meal prep service for a while or ordering out, you know, if, if financially you guys can afford to do so, it's like pull out all the stops, do whatever you can to make your life easier. It's worth the money if you have the money yes, to just agree. make it happen because yes. people, I mean, you mentioned this when we got on the call before we started recording about the depression rates, what tripling, I think you said. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's terrible. I, you know, because I treat women all day long, I, I'm hearing it firsthand from my patients that their anxiety levels are through the roof. They're, they're really clinically depressed. I hate to yeah. say it. Um, they've had it. They can't take it anymore. They, they're, at the, you know, they're, they're, they're bordering on the edge and they're consuming more alcohol than ever before. Yeah. They're asking me to prescribe them anti-anxiety medications more often. And it scares me because I, I think, you know, we're seeing, we're, we're promoting all these, not only mental, but now physical conditions that are going to happen from this. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. I think this is the struggle. For me, this is a time period where if you can afford it, I know it's nice to say, but sometimes in these particular situations, spend the money. At least it's an investment in your, in your quality of life and relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think trying to communicate and not yell over each other is super important. Mm -hmm. um, and just understanding that we are all in this pressure cooker right now if, is what it feels like. There's so many stressors coming at us from all angles. And so being extra forgiving of your partner or your family members, if they snap and if they are not their best and highest selves right now, it's really hard to be. We're, we're so stressed out. We're so triggered. We're so traumatized by everything that's going on. You're not, you're going to, you're not going to be your best self right now. So forgive yourself and forgive each other as quickly as you can for that. Forgive, love, and peace. All right, so <laughs> Sarah, we talked today about some of the red flags and some of the warning signs and some of the deep conversations one should have before committing to a lifetime relationship. Then we talked about the importance of discovering and continuing to discover each other while you have a family and kids in the house. But so a lot of our audience are actually done with that. And I know that, you know, another big point in relationships is when the kids actually leave and you become empty nesters. And that for a lot of people, that's, that's a breaking point in their relationship because they've been on autopilot for 18 years with their kids. And all of a sudden it's just the two of them and they have nothing to say to each other. Uh, so I want to hear from you, your recommendations when, you know, emotionally you're starting to get, depressed because the kids are graduating from high school and about to leave for college. Some of them are doing online courses, but how do you prep these couples? What do you recommend they do so that they can get back into a really good place? Mm -hmm. So I think the same resource that I said before, the Gottman card decks is a good place to start. Just kind of having new conversations and rediscovering yourself uh, and each other. I also on my website have um, 82 fun questions to ask your partner. It's a free download um, at coupleslearn.com. So that's a fun place to start. And then I'd say it could be really nice to start a hobby together because a lot of people bond more through doing things together and it gives you something new to talk about, um, to get excited about together. So maybe you learn a new skill or you, um, I know some couples have been taking advantage of the time at home by getting a masterclass membership and taking different masterclasses online where they learn how to cook or they learn how to paint or they learn how to garden. Um, I took up, I tried my hand at some carpentry during this quarantine no and built, built some flower boxes for my succulents. It was really fun. That's impressive. Yeah, and they have a master class on that kind of thing. So I think that could be a nice place to start to rekindle that friendship and those common experiences when you're the bulk of your common experiences for the last couple of decades have been your kids and their development. 
and now try to find some other common experiences together. And then I'm going to go after one last little topic, which is sexuality. Okay. So let me ask you, because you clearly stated that women really need sort of that stretch of working into before having the actual act of intercourse. Are there some exercises that you have your, your couples do that are having a hard time connecting intimately, maybe because it's been a year and, and they feel like, oh my God, I haven't been that way with you in so long. I don't even know how to do it anymore or start it anymore. What, what can they do to rekindle that without maybe jumping into it right away and being done in 30 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a practice called sensate focus that's sometimes nice for that, where you build up to different levels of intimate touch. So the first sensate focus might be just massaging each other. Um, maybe you even start with just massaging hands, like give your partner a hand and a foot massage or something. And then the second time it's maybe just like touching different parts of their body, but not sexual touch, you know, avoiding any genitals or erotic zones, but just tickling their arm or scratching their back or something like that. And then you gradually kind of build up to, okay, now you can massage erogenous zones, but you're not like trying to pleasure each other. You're just exploring touch and seeing how it feels. Yeah. And then eventually you feel more comfortable. You're kind of reintroduced to each other. And if you haven't had sex in a long time, you don't even know what your partner likes anymore. So it's just right. an exploration of, does this feel good? Do you like this still? I remember you used to like when I kissed you here. Is that still a thing? No? Okay, let's try something different. Um, so that's one thing you can do to kind of ease back into it. And it can start as basic as if you normally sit on separate chairs when you're watching a movie, sitting on the couch together and holding your hands or even just letting your arms touch. Yeah. Um, so it can start really small and just little moments of connection, physical connection can do a lot to kind of reawaken that, that sexual side of you. Yeah. Those are all good points. Yeah. And I'd say another thing you can do is, um, remembering some of your favorite sexual experiences together and figuring out what contributed to that being so great. Cause usually there's a whole buildup. Like, oh, we went to that wedding and it was so fun and we had a few drinks and we danced and we laughed and then we got back to the hotel room and it was just like so nice. We kept dancing in the room. Like there was a lot of build up before you got to the sexual experience that was a really great experience because of how much fun you had had together that night. That's so true. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those are all great points there. And, and I think we're, we're all going to do a little bit of reflection this evening as we listen. <laughs> Um, let me ask you, I, I, a lot of people are going to want to find out how to get a hold of you and your company and tell us a little bit about your contact information and how, how to, how do my audience find you? Yeah. So we're couples learn on everything. So the website is coupleslearn.com and we offer a free 30 minute consultation. So you can kind of explore whether therapy with one of our therapists is a good fit. Um, Instagram is couples learn, Facebook couples learn. Those are pretty much the three places that were the most active. Gotcha. And are people able to do 30 minute or, or they have to do one hour sessions? So our sessions are either 50 minutes or 80 minutes. And, or 80. Most, mm -hmm. and couples often will do 80 minutes because the time really flies when there's three people in the room yeah. or in the virtual room. Um, we, I have considered that actually offering a 30 minute kind of quick check-in session. So that may be something we offer in the future, um, yeah. but for now we do 50 or 80 minutes. Great. And I love the fact that you're doing everything virtual and that was done before the isolation of the pandemic. Yeah. I've, my practice has always been online. Genius. Yeah. I love that. Sarah, I'm so happy you came on the show. And you and I sort of met randomly, and then we realized we had so much in common. Yeah. I feel like I'm talking to an old friend. <laughs> um, and I know you and I will probably do a lot of work together, and I know that I'm going to send you a lot of my patients who definitely could use your services. Um, I appreciate that. And I'd love to have you back on the show talking more 
focused on sexuality and orgasms because mm-hmm. um, I do a lot of sexual medicine work and I've always wanted to have this podcast conversation about the stages of orgasm, both from a physiological and a mental state. Yeah. And how do we, how do we bring it all together? No. You, yeah. Or I would even actually recommend my team member, Chantrese Parks, who is a sex therapist and really knowledgeable in that area and probably would do a better job of explaining it all than me. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm going to leave Sarah to get back to work and, and I have a lady in labor, so I have to go. Oh. <laughs> but so nice chatting with you and I hope this was informative for everyone. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. And I look forward to the next show. Likewise.